Um, <clears throat> first of all, I like these next two slides in all my presentations, just so you know, uh, my farm is a family farm. I get recognized for some things, but it is a family farm. These are my parents. Uh, and as my dad always says, someone has to stay home and work while I'm out on the road being heckled by Mr. Dan Towery. So um, just want to recognize that it is a family farm, not just myself. Uh, we're about 1,800 acres uh, and uh, have a crop rotation of corn, beans, wheat, alfalfa, hay, uh, and then all the cover crops uh, that we're going to talk about. Second of all, I always like to put this slide in there. Uh, no matter who the speaker is in whatever session you're going to listen to today or tomorrow, please remember where they're from. Uh, that is very key. Something that uh, I may say here uh, may not always be the same in Oklahoma or Florida or California. So uh, know that what we're referencing is kind of the Midwest or the uh, Central Corn Belt here today. So. Uh, a little bit about our background and our farm and what we're doing and, and a few stories I wanted to tell um, is just so you know again some of the things we're going to go through um, myself and a lot of the customers that, that I work with and people that I help try to uh, get cover crops and, and no-till and soil health on their farm. Um, pretty much uh, everything on our farm is no-till since early 80s. Most everyone I work with is other than a few specialty crops. Cover crops, we are 100% acres covered uh, on our farm. Um, I put up their tile, just so everyone knows that uh, I normally forget to mention as we go through that uh, we're fairly well patterned drain. Um, most everything's either on 160 or 80 foot centers, um, just depending on soil type, we're in those ranges, so you know. Uh, again, crop rotation. Uh, we were corn beans like a lot of people. Uh, we went to corn beans wheat in the rotation, and you're going to see why and, and why more are doing that. We got some in this room that I may pick on uh, to tell some stories, but uh, um, they've seen the same things that we're going to talk about up here. And then two previous owners. Again, this is just for me to remind you to tell some stories. Um, actually, this is our uh, farming operation here that we work out of. Uh, the, the farm right here was 85 acres, uh, was one gentleman that helped me very, uh, uh, you know, learn soil health and, and cover crops and what we're doing. Um, still in a stressful year, uh, that farm's going to out yield anything that we farm. Uh, we've got one other landowner up north the same way. They were good stewards of the land. And I think something that's getting missed is, you know, when I first started out in conservation, it was like no-till was a cure-all. That's all you have to do to be successful and, and kind of think that's not right. Now it's almost like cover crops is all you have to do and that's not right. There's a lot to this system. Um, these two guys were stewards of the land, took care of it. Um, interesting that, um, you know, today we farm that all as one crop, but at the time the 85 acres was probably in 10, 11, or 12 different fields. Uh, not that I want to go back to farming those small acreages, but I think that's maybe part of the problem that we see today. If in event that I screw up a field, something's got to come back to replenish the whole, say, 160 acres versus he only had eight acres to come back and replenish with biological activity or things. So something to think about. And again, stories that I think are pretty important uh, throughout the whole Midwest. I'm going to talk about some stressful periods uh, that we've had. Uh, one, pretty much everyone knows, uh, you know, in the Midwest, 2012 was a drought year. And then uh, most of you know that 2015 uh, is what I call the monsoon season. Um, if you can't see, there, there are uh, actually rows of corn in this field where they're spearing carp out of. So again, a lot of rain. Um, we actually had that again this year on our farm. We averaged over three inches of rain a week from May the 20 something up until uh, about the first week of September. Um, so um, a lot of variation of, of weather in there and uh, all we can do is try to take out uh, you know, that stress the best we can and, and build our soil up to um, work with that. So. This was 2015. I'm going to show a few photos of what went on in the area of 2015 that I saw. Um, this picture was taken uh, in 2015, and I think it was one of the better cornfields I saw in the Midwest. I'm going to tell you a little bit of story and hop back and forth between these two photos. In the summer of 2015, as I traveled around, everyone said that you know we've had so much rain the cure-all is going to be tile that's what we need we need to put them about 10 foot apart 
and you know really get them in there so we can get rid of the water so right away after hearing that i went and took a picture of this field and i kind of lied to everyone all summer long i didn't realize i said there was uh, one tile across this field i lied there's two it goes out and branches off so um, i tried to correct that but still not pattern drained by any means when i tell you what this field is you're going to come back and say well no doubt there's no that's the reason why that field looks that good but i think it's very important uh, to see the differences in here and, and draw some conclusions. So I tell the story that I think every seed corn dealer fought every night to put a sign up in front of this field in 2015 because it looked that good. The, the sign that should have went up there is soil health and, and, and that's what it was that made this field of corn look as even as it was across there from, from one end to the other. This is the same farmer, same corn planted the same day right across the road picture taken the same day so again remember all the rain you saw the guy spearing fish out of the field this is the same field I don't have to tell you how many tile are in this field you can see the pattern drainage of this one so again not pattern drainage isn't gonna be the cure-all for all of our problems here um, so any idea why these two fields would look so much different and so this was the first one, same farmer again, planted the same day, pictures taken the same day. And again, this one's the soil health. What it is, is this field was CRP ground. It was no-tilled into beans, and this was no-tilled into corn. And everyone says, well, I can't leave my field lay for 15 years to, to get this effect. And I, and I agree with that. We need to use cover crops and our rotations and things to be able to weather that much rain and get as close to the situation as we can without leaving it lay in CRP for 10 to 20 years. The sad thing is this field was CRP six years before I took this photo. In six years, with modern farming practices, they're able to, to compact it, tear it down, take it right back to, to this level of, of what we saw in 2015. So this was really close to me. This is a good friend of mine. Um, that uh, he says he chases CRP acres because he uses less fertilizer, less fungicide, less insecticide, and it's more profitable, uh, but still trying to convince him that maybe cover crops could help him uh, get back to this level without leaving ground or chase those acres that have been rested for 10 or 15 years. But I, but I think a very good story is, again, soil health, as much rain as we had, still was good corn, and, and I'd say this was one of the better yielding fields of corn around. Uh, in a pretty big area in 2015. This is one of our fields that I went and took. Uh, this was at the beginning of that rain period where we were starting to get record rainfall in the month of June in 2015. And again, I'm going to show two photos of not the same farmer, but right across the road. And, and this is not letting our ground lay for 15 years, but farming it every year with diversity, with rotation you know, focusing on soil health and taking care of that ground, similar to what my two neighbors did that, that I say were good mentors of, of where we're at today. Um, this was taken where uh, everyone else was trying to side dress their corn and put nitrogen on. You can see the color of this corn. And, and again, the cover crops were feeding nutrients back and, and getting us by uh, to where, you know, we just were getting record rainfall that year. And this was the field of corn right across the road from us that actually was planted the same day. I don't know that it was the same corn, um, but just right across the road. And, and again, just terrible conditions in 2015. But again, with soil health and cover crops and diversity and rotation, we can still weather a lot of those, whether it be the drought of 2012 or what I call the monsoon of 2015 or those weather events we have been getting. So uh, around the Midwest and a lot of areas that we work in, you know, this is what we want to see. I think most of the cover crops, I say north of Indianapolis, Indiana, Columbus, Ohio, those areas, we ought to see this at harvest time. Um, that's why Dan's going to talk about interseeding here in a little bit. Again, giving us some more options to get our fields to have green in them when we start to harvest. This photo was taken in 2009. It was the year of almatoxin in, in the area that a lot of you had, and I went out and clipped this photo because uh, everyone else had cover crop seed in the building and trying to figure out how do we get it on? How, how, how are we going to get that cover crop out there this year? Because actually in this photo, the corn was still high 30% moisture 
and uh, it was a really late harvest in 2009 and, and anyone that tried to put cover crop on realized that they weren't going to get it on every acre if they didn't already have it out there. So again, pretty common practice uh, in our area. Um, unfortunately, monocultures a lot of times, cereal rye, annual rye, uh, some crimson clover, some rapeseed, um, you know, some radishes, a uh, few oats and radish thrown in. Uh, but, but a lot of guys trying to get it on pre-harvest uh, broadcast out there with high boys or airplanes in some fashion. On our farm and a lot of the guys we're working with, there's a few in this room I know that we've kind of went a little different route. Um, definitely, uh, you know, want cover crops and, and to increase that diversity, increase that rotation. Instead of just a corn or corn bean rotation, uh, put wheat in there and really have seen some big improvements. Um, I even had a guy in the hallway a little bit ago and said, are, are, do you think that some of the yield responses that we're seeing, are those real? Or I hear stories. And so, um, yes, they, by adding weed in there and then adding some, some other species of cover crops, we're really seeing some benefits to that. Um, so we had to go back and learn how to raise wheat again. Um, I have a good friend that uh, he farms vegetables. Uh, he's in southwest Michigan. And he came to me one day and said that he's leaving some ground lay to improve. And, and he said, does anyone else do this to where they don't farm ground for the year? And I said, well, kind of, I put weed out there. I'm not really making any income. It's, it's for improving the ground. So, but a lot more of this is going on. Once guys try this, they really get stuck to it and see what it's doing for the soil and for their farm. I use these next two slides to show that, and again, and, and especially the, the northern part of the Midwest, uh, you know, Indianapolis North, uh, Columbus, Ohio North, up into Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, that there's a lot of cover crops out there. But if we're gonna wait until after harvest, unfortunately, we limit ourselves as to what we can use as a cover crop. So, you know, we can try to get by and push the envelope on a few things. You know, you can put rapeseed, radishes, some clovers and stuff in there. But realistically, if we read the book on when they should be in and what we're going to do, we, we narrow it down to just a few products. You're being generous there. I, I am trying to be generous there. Dan's right. So, again, that's why we're looking at things like broadcasting ahead of time. So why Dan's going to talk about interseeding and, and stuff here in a little bit. So, but again, trying to get back to more of these species that we can use or even more than this now. Um, and one of the way to do it is if you have a specialty crop, if you're gonna chop silage off early, or if you can put wheat, uh, you know, some other uh, crop in your rotation. So I'm gonna talk about cocktail mixes just a little bit and you don't have to take notes on, on what those are. I don't think they're anything special, um, you know, I. I'll be honest with you, I'd say five, six, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, I saw a lot of people talking about cocktail mixes and I thought it was nothing more than a competition. I thought if Dan got up and said he used 13 things, I wanted to get up and say I used 14 things so that I could beat him. So luckily though, I took it back to the farm and tried it to see what it was and, and pretty impressed with what happened. So I'm not here to say that there's one cocktail mix that, that you have to have. I'm here to say that the more diversity and more rotation you can get on your farm, the better off we're going to be on a lot of avenues. So um, basically what I want you to focus on or what we want to talk about with this slide is the, the same thing that my dad focused on the first time that I took this sheet to him. And so in 2013, we were starting to go to a lot more of these mixes and, and, and ramp them up. And uh, I worked for quite a while, worked with Barry Fisher, worked with a lot of other people on getting this carbon nitrogen ratio, different seeds per square foot and everything right with this. Walked in the office the first morning and told my dad, I said, I think I have it. We have 425 acres of wheat this year. And, and uh, he said, uh, what do you got? I laid the sheet on the table and he said, uh, had one question. Anyone want to know what it is? What's it cost? That's the only thing he cared about, was what does it cost? And I said, well, you know, I, I agree, you know, but let, let me explain what's in there and what if we produce this much nitrogen and what about this? And 
he wasn't having it. He basically said that maybe you should go find another job because on a farm we have to be profitable and there's no way we're going to spend $54 an acre and get that done. So the first year out of 425 acres of wheat, we put 100 acres of this mix out. And I'm here to tell you that if my dad was here today, he wished he would have put 425 acres of this mix out to wheat. And the first thing that he says now is, what are you going to change and what are you going to add to this mix? Not that he forgot about this cost down here, but it's not as important as what's the profitability of the system. And, and that's really where I think we should focus is, what, what are we going to get to? And, and so we had a meeting Tuesday this week that a, a friend of mine from vegetable country again was there and, and he's convinced me that, you know, we don't know if this is profitable or, or successful until we try some of it on the farm. And so a few of us um, have tried this mix and then we're actually coming in and broadcasting another cover crop on top of it and spending up to another $30 per acre. And so that sounds really crazy, but if it pays for itself, then, then it, it, it's a good thing to do. So um, again, I, I wanna talk about that cost or, or get you to not focus on it. Look at the benefits of what's in there, what it does to your farm, and then come back and see if it's profitable. Don't let the cost scare you away. The other thing I'll say is, again, not big on that this mix is the same, but I've never seen a mix that anyone created based on cost that works. For, you got to forget about the cost to begin with, build the mix, because if you start building it based on, I only want to spend $10 an acre, you'll mess up the ratios, you'll mess up everything in there. So be very careful with focusing on that cost to begin with in your mixes. I'm just going to show three years, and again, you'll see they changed a little bit of what we put in and out. The main thing is to see that that cost is coming down. And, and the main reason is there's more of, of all of us planting these mixes and species to where it's easier to get facilia, it's e easier to get sun hemp, it's easier to, to secure these seeds. So again, don't get scared at the $54 an acre. Actually today, a lot of the mixes are around $30 an acre that, that are getting the same benefit and the same diversity out there. So. Seed-wise of, of those mixes, uh, a lot of people say, well, I, you know, they got rid of drills or I don't have a drill with a grass seed attachment to the front of it, what do we do? And, and so we're putting this right through the main box of a drill. We have guys with air seeders that are putting this on. There's a lot of different seed sizes in there, but, but actually it stays mixed fairly well and it'll go through all there and, and you're not gonna see it in the field. And I've got some pictures later where you know, the sunflowers you'll see scattered throughout. They're not all on one side of the field and all the clovers on the other side, so. Just a few pictures of those mixes along the way, just so you can get the feel for, for what they are and, and what they're doing. Again, the only problem I see with these mixes are that you can't really use them after corn or beans. They, they have to be after a specialty crop, after wheat, after something uh, that you can get off early. This is a photo taken, uh, actually uh, could have taken this photo last year and then uh, been three years ago now that both were this tall. Um, a few people, I don't see anyone in this room that was in that category, but a few people that have listened to my talk and went home and tried this, um, then contact me in December and say, well, that was a really neat joke. What are you gonna do with all that material now? Are we gonna burn it, mow it? How do we get rid of all this? And and so that's why I'm gonna show you the next few slides is because you know, we have a lot of time to grow biomass, to grow nitrogen, to grow a lot of things out of these mixes. And so I had a guy last year that called me every week for I think seven weeks. And I kept telling him just be patient, be patient. And, and so I finally had to go walk the field with him to show him that it wasn't gonna be a problem. But again, a lot of material that we've grown with extra sunlight, extra moisture, uh, to help that field out and, and to put all those species on our farm. So currently with corn, beans, and wheat, and, and ryegrass is the main cover crop that's not in this cocktail mix, we're up to 20 some different species that hit our farm in, in a three year rotation or, or 20 some different roots that are hitting our soil. So here's a few quick pictures of what it looks like throughout the growing season. And again, planning into it, um, the next question always is, what do we have to do to our planter? 
as you can see by this time in the spring it's pretty well starting to deteriorate down um, the uh, the one reason the guy called me for seven weeks or straight last year was we didn't have the snow cover or ice storm to kind of knock it down and so it was actually not like that when you planted into it last spring but still no problems uh, we do have row cleaners on our planter, but have not used them for three years. You can either way will work, um, uh, but pretty much any planter is going to go into there. And anyone that's planted into it, there's again some guys here in the room. It's pretty much like potting soil that you're planting into with with, with this type of system. This photo is uh, with row cleaners on this side and, and without row cleaners on the left. Um, everyone always says with that much material, um, you know, how are you getting rid of it? How are you warming up the soil? Um, through CCSI and some of the programs that, that we have here in Indiana, we've actually doing temperature reading and, and, and looking at different things, stand counts. And so the stand counts have been better where we don't have the row cleaners. The soil temperature is actually higher where we don't have the row cleaners. And it's because our nights get so cold that we removed some of our insulation over here, we're actually seeing better emergence, better soil temperatures, more consistency where we have that blanket of material over on that side. Here's some pictures throughout the growing season. And again, just to kind of show, you know, the residue level. And, and again, everyone always says, well, you know, in their fields, how do we get rid of the corn stalks? How do we get rid of the bean stubble residue? And I want to show you how our field progresses here as to where that residue goes when, when you change your rotation and add diversity. This is just throughout the growing season. This picture here was taken, I think, around July 4th, just a little bit after. Um, a good friend of mine was down from Ontario, and we were out walking through the field looking for all kinds of things. And uh, I clicked this picture, you can already start to see bare soil from all that material. It was five, six, seven, eight feet tall, starting to disappear. And this is closer to harvest time. And again, almost looks like a conventionally tilled field. Just the residue is just disappearing from, from all the activity in that field. Sure you're in the same field? Same field, Dan. Yep. Other interesting thing is, might be hard to see in here, but every one of those corn leaves are already trying to be pulled down by earthworms that you know with all that material they're still hungry there's there's so much going on so always kind of get a laugh at someone saying how do we get rid of corn stalks or how do we get rid of our residue so question so the question was what kind of nitrogen program am i running with this and i'm kind of laughing because i i think dan planted this question he he always wants to have me tell everyone exactly how much we're doing. So, yep. So, Dan always wants me to tell the exact amount and timing. I, I always answer his question this way, is that we have to be very careful that I, I'm in a system where we've been no-till since the 80s, we've been long-term no-till, and then you know we moved into here, and it, it's, it's totally different, even on a farm that we may take on versus one we've had long-term. But our nitrogen system is that we're putting a little bit down with the planter. We're coming back and side dressing as soon as we can because the only potential shortfall here is while some of this is starting to return nitrogen to us. After that, it, it, there is too much there. When we do stalk nitrate tests in the fall, we, we have way too much. So I've tracked annual ryegrass, um, hairy vetch, and, and this cocktail mix side by side. If I look at, and cereal rye, so if I look at annual rye grasses, it's one that's gonna return nitrogen quicker than cereal rye, they start to break down. Hairy vetch is a good one. This one actually was almost as quick as annual rye grass and hairy vetch to, to bring that nitrogen back, but this one actually brought more pounds of nitrogen back than a pure stand of hairy vetch. So we do not have to put near as much on because of that. So on, good point, because I normally have one guy in the crowd everywhere that reminds me. So also we're putting one ton of pelletized chicken litter on prior to the cover crop so that it's helping grow the cover crop and do some things. So we have that in the cover crop to where we basically don't have to put much on. We're giving a little bit at planter and a little bit there at side dress to, to get it by and then we're golden.
So. So the question is, uh, how much nitrogen basically are we putting on? He's wanting to get, when we're planting, he's wanting me to get down to Dan's level. So I, again, I'm going to answer it this way. So I don't want to get anyone in trouble. I, we have planted with, we have put zero nitrogen on behind this cocktail mix and saw no yield drop be, because of the the amount of nitrogen that's there. So we're putting very small amount on with the planter, very small amount with side dress. But again, long-term no-till since the 80s, you know, we've had cover crops on the farm continuously for over 15, eight, 15 years, and then have switched to this cocktail mix to where sometimes we're going on the second to third cycle of corn, beans, wheat in there. So we have to be very careful that your first time into something that, that we're not shaving to that. But again, we do some side-by-sides and have side-by-sides where we're not putting any nitrogen on and, and no yield reduction. Yep. So the question was, what about something that we just take on? And, and, and that's where it's tough to decide through the years where, where to position that. And so that's why we're normally putting just a small amount on with the planter and a small amount with side dress. But based off of pre-side dress test and tissue test and trying to get that right. But we're still, when you put one ton of pelletized chicken litter on and you're raising all that nitrogen, if you looked at the sheet breakdown of cover crops, half of the mix is legumes that was in there. Again, I, I'm, I'm very, very small, but I, I, I hate to throw a number out because like Dan says, there's, someone's gonna go home and try it. And, and so I'm, I'm here to say that again, we've done the test and, and we've got certain fields where we're not putting anything on be, because it's that close to all the nitrogen you need. Right, so the question was, you know, testing wise, you want those and yes, you, you know, we don't want to run out. Um, I have a high boy sprayer to where I can go back and pull your feet and give things a little bit if I'm off. And again, we're watching that throughout the season. But like I said, I've done the comparisons with Harry Vetch and this side by side, and, and this is returning more nitrogen than the Harry Vetch field. And, and so a lot of organic guys that are getting by with no nitrogen and just Harry Vetch, so. So the question was nitrogen on wheat, and, and yes, we are on the other side of the scale on wheat, and um, we, are, we are giving the wheat a, we're feeding the wheat a bunch, not, not just nitrogen, but everything. And so, I, again, I'm, I'm not gonna give you that number on wheat because there would be people run scared the other way in here. But I'm, I'm here to say that if, if we're gonna push wheat yields, we've gotta push the nitrogen there. I have wheat specialists that we work with that also say that we shouldn't be doing that much but to achieve those yields. So the problem with wheat and nitrogen is the standability. So you have to be very careful that as you push that, that you've done some other things to maintain standability with wheat. You're gonna get in trouble. Good question. So the question was, is there anything that's winter hardy in this mix? And yes, there's uh, three clovers in there that's going to overwinter. Um, there is uh, some vetch in there that's... The, the picture that we saw had been burnt down. There are years that we do not. It depends on the spring. So when I go into cover crops, we have some that are, they're, they're, you know, got ryegrass on fields that need burnt down. Some going to corn, some going to beans or, you know, depending throughout the years. And then this cocktail mix gives you a lot of flexibility. We can burn it down. We don't have to. There, there, there's uh, clovers. There's a few vetches that are going to make it through. Uh, and then there's the occasional rapeseed or turnip that's going to live through the winter, depending on where we're at. Now, and the question was, you know, are we worried about losing nitrogen in the spring? And, and we are not with, 
with the amount of material that's there and again trying to keep that carbon carbon nitrogen ratio right in that mix and some things we're we're not seeing a problem with with losing that whatsoever so So the question was, uh, I, he assumes we have good organic matters and, and has, do I know anyone that's tried it on sandy soils or, or uh, different CECs? And so Steve, uh, I know you tried it this year, what? Yeah, uh, most of my organic matters are at one or less. Some spots it's really good, I mean. So, yeah, it's phenomenal results. So, so. So, so just so everyone can hear, Steve saying his organic matters were around one, and again, uh, his cocktail mix last fall was so good, he got tired of everyone asking questions, and he called a field day and said, you just got to come talk about it. And at harvest time this year, he called me and he said, uh, I didn't really think this was possible. It's quite a bit better corn than he'd had on the farm before. And uh, so talk to Steve afterwards again. He's, he's witnessed the same thing, and... and uh, um, he even had one guy say, well, no doubt with irrigated corn, you're probably going to have those kinds of yield, but it was not irrigated corn. So, and he, he did not have the three inches of rain a week like we did. He's in a little drier area with the sandy soils. So, um, this, this is something that, um, that works a lot of places. I'm going to show a field here where we actually put it two years back to back and I'll talk about some of that, but the organic matters reminds me that the farm, I don't know if I said, but the farm that I started out saying was across the field that was, you know, kind of a good example to me. My dad bought that farm in 1976 and the organic matters on that farm were somewhere between 3.9 and 4.2. Um, I always say with modern farming practices, we were able to take that all the way down to about 2.2 before it dawned on us that maybe we should take care of the farm like he did. And we're back up to about three and a half, 3.6. Uh, on a lot of our soils, just so you know, on organic matters. But by the end of the season, you can see that material has been decomposed, biological activities using it, um, and uh, you know, a lot of good things going on. Yield wise, I just throw a picture in here to remind myself to talk to you about yield advantage. And so, uh, again, this year with that amount of rainfall, um, we had 40 bushel better corn or real close to 40 bushel better corn where we had the cocktail mix on our farm versus where we didn't. So um, I'm not saying you're getting that every year. We've had a lot of years where we have 20 bushel, um, but we've had several years here in recent history where we were uh, 40 bushel better corn. And I think if you talk to Steve, he had every bit of 40 bushel, maybe better corn than that. Yep, and so um, I was talking to a guy in the hallway beforehand. I still had a cover crop on the field that, that it was 40 bushel better then, and the field that I had cocktail mix was not pattern drained, and the one that was 40 bushel less was pattern drained with that over three inches of rain uh, every week for May 20th to September. So pretty big results, and, and I'm not saying it's the cocktail mix. I, as much as it's diversity and rotation it, that's helping everything that I really think we need to, to understand that the, the, the larger we can get our diversity and rotation scale out there, the better off we are. Also wanted to say that that corn in all those pictures was uh, naked seed. We are 100% uh, non-GMO corn and what? careful Dan. Um, no seed treatment whatsoever. I'm again not saying go home and do that. I'm just saying that with what we are and so when we get to the very end and I talk about profitability, know that we're not paying for some of those things to help us get to those levels of profitability. So again, uh, 100%. This is the first fall that we're 100% on wheat. We've been kind of working our way into that. Uh, corn, we've been there for five years, and soybeans, I can probably tell you that we've only had a pallet of treated soybeans on our farm ever. So, And yet we do have bugs. I'm not here to say that we're bug-free, but because of beneficials in the field, we're just not worried about it um, and you know, have not had problems, actually seen some real problems with some of the treated 
uh, fields that, that I work with on cover crops. Blaming it on cover crops, maybe seeing some other issues rather than, than things like that that have led to the problems. So, so this is a picture that um, that good friend of mine from Southwest Michigan um, that is big into soil health and cover crops and, and diversity um, convinced me that um, I had a field of cocktail mix one year that just wasn't up to 100% of where I thought it should be. And he asked me, he said, what goes in that field next year? I said, our rotation is corn, beans, wheat. So after wheat goes cocktail mix and then the corn. And he said, why? I said, because our rotation is corn, beans, and wheat. And he said, but why? You just said it didn't do as good. And so the farmer in me said, well, you know, like my dad said, we got to raise a crop to, you know, pay the bills. So we're going to corn next year. And so he told me a story that he'd bought a farm and for either four or five years, he put it alfalfa, never took a cutting alfalfa on it, blew it right back on the field and sunk a well and put drip line irrigation in. Of course, he's vegetables and I'm corner beans, a little different, but on the fifth or sixth year, he put it to tomatoes and he said, I paid for the alfalfa, the well, the drip line irrigation, and the farm because of that fifth or sixth year, that field was rested and ready to go. So this is the first year where we actually took wheat uh, a year ago that was a cocktail mix and instead of planting it, we put it uh, back to a cover crop mix for two years and then this year it went to soybeans. And um, I can tell you this, that uh, we're probably going to look to maybe do a little more of that, that uh, my district conservationist was on the farm. We have a, a local college come out for a two-day class, and the first day I set all the trucks we own there and tried to get by while I talked to the college class, and we did fine. The second day, about three-fourths of the way through the college program, my dad called and said, you got to come dump trucks. They're full. And my district conservationist said, what field are you running? Because yesterday you guys got all the way through the presentation and he never called. And today your semis are all full, what happened? And the reason was, is we were running this field that was wheat, a cover crop cocktail mix, back to a cover crop mix, and then to beans. Again, guys in our area say, well, that's crazy. A year ago in, in August, I had a meeting all the area farmers were there and saying, you're nuts, what are you doing? Because you didn't plant a crop in that field. And so I asked him, I said, last year in July or in August, we were hot and dry back to almost 2012 drought conditions and the way crop prices were. I said, what do you think I was going to make per acre on this field? And he said, you think you were going to make money farming last year in the middle of July and August with little to no rain? This is the second highest point in our county. I said, good, that's what I wanted you to get to, is that I probably was going to lose money farming that. Can we agree upon a number that I was going to lose farming it? He said, oh, I hate to say. I said, would you agree that I'd have probably lost close to 50 bucks an acre putting that to corn and the inputs and second highest place in the county dry? And he said, yes. I said, I only lost 38 bucks an acre. So instead of losing 50 farming it, I only lost 38 and proving it to go back to a crop that out yielded every farm we had this year in soybeans. And so I'm not here to say everyone go try that, but I'm here to say based on that guy that's a vegetable farmer that was willing to walk away from, he was taking $30,000 an acre off a year ago when I was up there produce to, to help maintain and, and manage this ground for longer down the road. And so we now look at things on our farm in five or 10 year cycles to, to help improve the soil and, and to do some things. And we're rewarded very well for that again this year. Also, I know there's others talked about planting green, a lot more of that going on in our area. And, and this is us uh, uh, no-tilling into, uh, this happens to be annual ryegrass or we do annual ryegrass and cereal rye, other things as well. But um, this is uh, more and more all the time uh, going on. Again, as I think one of the other speakers mentioned, just be careful if you're going to do this and it becomes a hot and dry year like 2012, you have to terminate that cover crop. That moisture that it pulls will absolutely kill you on yield. So again, if you're starting out wanting to do this and it gets hot and dry, terminate it extremely fast. When it gets big, it's pulling a lot of moisture for us. Just other pictures of that. Uh, again, a lot of guys starting to plant green into stuff. 
Um, one of the other speakers also mentioned weed control. And so um, this is one of the fields where this is 30 inch row beans. And uh, this was a uh, burn down of the cover crop, basically planted green, burn down a cover crop um, and letting that cover crop be our mat. This picture was taken in the, the middle of August sometime. I was going across foliar feeding some beans and um, it, we'd never resprayed this field. So as far as weed control inputs, everything that's in there by, by allowing that cover crop to get a little bit taller, giving us some more protection on the ground actually is very beneficial for our weed control. And, and a lot of the guys in our area are utilizing this uh, rather than more chemicals all the time to help control those weeds. This is one quart equivalent of Roundup, so back to say original formulation rates. And again, that's all the glyphosate we used on that farm in that year. So trying to, uh, in moderation, no matter what we use, not, not go overboard. Yeah, so the question was with the same, uh, you know, weed control result from drilling versus 30 inch rows. And so actually my normal presentation, I show a picture of both, they're identical. I, I took the picture on the way to this field of a drilled field and this one, and, and, and I've got them in cereal rye and annual rye both. The, the benefit is, is that, you know, we get into warmer temperatures, we, we, we kill some of that stuff, and with, with the more mat of material, we shade it out. And so we've got it drilled in seven and a half, tens, 15s, and 30 inch rows. Uh, showing the, the good weed control. So, How about yield? question then was about yields, and so I, I mean, on our farm, I would rather have 30 inch row beans, or we do a lot of twin row beans, and uh, so it just depends whether we're drilling. I'm actually blocking off some of the holes in that drill you saw, using it more to roll the stuff down, but but only in uh, seven and a half inches apart and 22 and a half inches between rows. So I. Myself on our farm, we'd rather have road beans. And again, a lot of people say, well, the reason we went to drilled solid is for weed you know, control. And, and that's why I picked the one with 30 inch rows showing that you know, still at that, and, you know, no problem. Um, real quick, I just want to hit on this. I think no matter where we are, uh, you know, Midwest or anywhere, I think we're kind of missing this point. Um, I'll try to fly through this and, and not take a lot of time, but I do want to mention it. What this simulates is I need to change the slide here on the right. It actually was flown on, but in my mind, there's only two ways to seed cover crops. One is basically you put them in the ground or drill them like it's on the left side of the screen or the right side, which is basically broadcast. So you're either going to put cover crops on top of the ground or in the ground. A lot of time we argue about an airplane, a high boy or, you know, vertical tillage or drill. But those only two methods I found is in the ground and, and, and on top of the ground. So as we go through the next slide or two here, it's going to be the same thing. Drilled's going to be on the left, the broadcast is going to be on the right. So if you were to drive by and, and this line down the middle represents a road, these are two fields of ours that um, we had uh, drilled some cover crops in here. I'm, I'm going to tell you everyone in this room would like it. It's even. Every plant's up. Every corner's covered. It, it, it'd be your preferred method to seed a cover crop. On the, on the right hand side of the road is a field that was flown on or broadcast on. And again, you're going to have maybe a corner missed. You're going to have a spot that didn't look as good uh, if you drive by it. You know, some of your neighbors may make fun of you and say, well, I don't know why they did that. They didn't get a perfect stand. They should have drilled it like the other side. In December, I don't know what year it was. I, I should go back and look. We had an inch and a half of rain. And I've never seen annual ryegrass allow the, the soil to move. It roots so fast. And that year, we actually saw soil move with that December rain. Went out and uh, started walking the field. It's hard to take pictures of roots in a pit, bring them inside, and, and put on a presentation. So I um, actually tried to make a slide up to represent what we saw. Again, this is the drilled side. Everything even across the top. Um, couldn't hardly walk across that field after an inch and a half, an inch and three quarters of rain. It was so smeary. You were adding mud to your boots. I mean, it, it, it was terrible. Um, went across the road to the side that had been broadcast, and I probably could have went home and got a full semi and drove across the farm. No mud to my boots. Really no water standing whatsoever. So been a big fan of cover crops. Had been a big fan of getting them on ahead of time. Even I think I missed the point of how important it was. 
This is what we saw underground when we dug those root pits. The reason of this is to drill anything on after harvest, you have to wait until after harvest. And so that is a real issue that I, it doesn't really matter where you're at. I've got a good friend in southern Indiana that I consider that he has to come up, you know, to Florida in the winter time, and, and he makes fun of me because I'm north of the North Pole. We're, we're really only five hours apart, but a big growing season difference. I went down to his place. This still holds true. Day by day, you can see the difference of getting cover crops on versus not, and we're losing benefits out of that. So I went back to my area again, Doppler radar, looked at the average data. Uh, I picked September 7th as an average day that we're gonna broadcast seed on top of the ground, airplane, high boy, whatever. And then I just picked one month later just, just to show data. In that one month, we lost an hour and a half of sunlight and 12 degrees temperature to establish those cover crops. And so I don't think I ever got this point across good enough until we did a cover crop field day the last day of April here in Indiana, and there was 100 farmers at that cover crop field day because the soil temperature was 42 degrees. No one was home planting because it was too cold, and I said, well, let's add the 12 degrees to it, and where would everyone be? Home planting corn. So we're worried about that temperature in the springtime. We forget how quick it tapers off in the fall time. Um, a friend of mine at Kokomo did the same day that comes out exactly the same. Lose an hour and a half of sunlight and 12 degrees temperature as we try to wait. There's a lot of years where, where I was that red dot in northern Indiana. I, I couldn't get beans off in, in anything drilled by October 7th. So it actually could go October 15th or later that you start losing more. So be very careful. I say north of Indianapolis, north of Columbus, Ohio. Really, we, we ought to have a majority of our cover crops on at harvest time. And, and again, why Dan's going to talk about interseeding here is another option. Don't forget to mention Springfield, Illinois, Well, the problem is the temperature line kind of curves up. So I'm just giving an example of, of where that zone would be here in Indiana, Ohio. Again, data is out there. You can look it up. If, you know, the sooner you get something seeded, the more nutrients it's pulling up, the more benefits that are there to it. Um, look at that. Again, I think we're missing the point. We need to get stuff on sooner rather than later. This is a picture that I took of drilling wheat. Um, very similar to cover crops. I saw this with a buddy in southern Indiana when I went down there. He puts his cover crops on with a corn head or bean head. And this happened day to day. I kept telling him, back up, what's the line right here? And he said, that's where we started yesterday or stopped yesterday running corner beans. What this is, is you can see a, a line right here where the wheat's a lot greener. Can anyone guess how, what's the time difference between these two? Guess, Dan? Uh, one day? Less than 24 hours. So what we did is we went around that field four times, started on the other side and came over to here and finished within one day. And that's the difference in growth. And, and that's what we're seeing with cover crops. And I'm not that smart, but I saw Tuesday. I just couldn't remember if he could remember back to Tuesday. So, um, so the other thing I want to mention is, again, broadcast seeding. It's something we're normally known for with airplanes. We, we do several acres a year with this, 50, 60,000 acres normally with airplanes. And something else that I feel is, is being missed or, or, again, the timing is critical. You can see this airplane's flying over pure green corn. There are stories out there that you got to wait till a certain leaf stage and what's going on. I'm here to tell you that, that my acres will be flown like this. The Cameron Millses, the Mike Starkeys, Jack Maloney's, those that have had success with aerial seeding or broadcasting, this is the stage they're going. This is a picture that I took uh, of a guy flying a little bit later in the season, already half the field harvested and broadcasting on. I'm not sure why we're waiting that long to try to broadcast a seed on top of the ground. So, I'm not making fun of anyone. I just feel like, again, we ought to get going, get that seed started. If you're going to broadcast, I, I'm, I'm really not sure where the, the dry down of the leaf came or anything. So, but there's a lot of articles out there. Uh, this happens to be one that's very confusing. Again, be careful what we read or listen to. Uh, if anyone remembers this article, right here's a line in the field. 
And basically this article is saying don't seed too early, you're gonna get in trouble. Yet the photo is of good cover crop and bad cover crop. The difference is they harvested this side of the field early, came back later and harvested this side, but then start to talk about seeding dates of the cover crops. It was harvest dates of the cover crop, and I will agree, the sooner you can get your cash crop off the field, the better you're gonna have success at cover crop. But the funny thing is, is that if you read down through here, there's all kinds of pro tips on how not to seed too early. When the front of the magazine that I picked up that it was in, this is the picture that's on it. So, I, I, I'm just saying be careful with what you read and what you do because it says definitely don't seed too early uh, with cover crops.